All right, so I'm speaking here as uh, a representative of the Robert Bosch company in Cluj and the engineering center. And I would like to introduce to you AIoT. Um, AIoT is an acronym that stands for the use of artificial intelligence with the Internet of Things. And I'm pretty sure the natural question that comes up is why do we need another buzzword? And is it just a buzzword or is there more behind it? Um, of course, the Internet of Things is not a new concept anymore. Um, more and more intelligent products and services get connected uh, in order to create added value for their users. For example, 92% of all uh, Robert Bosch product classes are connectable and it is believed that there will be around 25 billion connected things by 2025 coming from roughly 14 billion uh, that were connected in 2019. So as the devices are being connected and start sending data, what do we do with it? Do we just forget it again? Um, on the other hand, artificial intelligence algorithms need data to learn from. They are always just as good as the data they've been trained on. So the key factor in this context is the data which is resulting from the use of intelligent connected products or from the interaction between people and machines or between machines themselves. So linking IoT with AI and machine learning we can then draw the right conclusions from these huge quantities of data and can react to this data during product engineering in mere seconds. So we learn from data and can thus improve our products and services on an ongoing basis. Um, this becomes even more important as the corona pandemic, climate change and digitalization are changing the people's needs and desires. Uh, AIoT makes it possible to develop new products much faster. At the same time, by using over the air updates, we can optimize already in use customers products during their lifetime, or we can add new uh, functionalities to them. We also have to admit that by far the heaviest investments in the sphere of AR are being made in the US and China. Uh, quantitatively, uh, Europe appears to be an also ran. But this is all the more important not to neglect a qualitative difference. So while the major US IT companies earn most of their money with data based services, European companies have the opportunity to become global leaders with industrial AI applications. And it is especially here that they can play to their strengths. And that is both the manufacture of complex physical products and the evaluation of machine and product data. And it's precisely this domain knowledge that Bosch combines with uh, IoT and AI expertise. So now let's have a look at how AIoT influences the value creation cycle. The value creation step encompasses multi stages uh, in a product's life cycle from the product development and manufacturing to the product usage by the customer. In a traditional value creation cycle, the feedback loop back to the product manufacturer is very slow because it needs manual interaction. Um, why is that? It's because data is collected only through triggered and targeted activities and usually in relatively small batches by means of market research campaigns or quality claims that might appear in time. Uh, but this also means that the product has to be used for a certain amount of time until a feedback collection can even be started. Um, the feedback action then takes place for a defined period of time. Data is collected and only at the end of this activity, the batch of data is sent to be analyzed. The result of the analysis itself is also limited by the data that is available. So, for example, the conclusions that can be taken on developing new features are constrained by the questions that were asked during the market research. By adding AI to the IoT, we create a closed loop uh, value creation cycle. 
that can even be automated. So it's much faster and thus enables us to be more agile and focus even more on the users. The driving force of the cycle is the creation of business value and it's sustained by a constant data flow. This is its, its life force, its, its blood. So let's have a closer look at each uh, step. Um, connected products, as we discussed already, provide data. Bosch is using this data during research and development to improve applications and revise or supplement functions. At the same time, we can improve the security and reliability of our products on an ongoing basis and adapt them to meet the individual needs of customers. Improving the production process of a product by reducing costs or improving quality and thus reducing scrap rates also creates added value, as well as um, finding alternative uh, components and materials which are more uh, reliable. This is possible because the life cycle of a product and the data creation and gathering starts already in the uh, ideation phase, goes through all stages of its engineering, both hardware and software, its manufacturing and logistics. When these products and services are then used by the customer, they also generate data, which we then use in the following phases of the cycle to improve the products and applications. Um, to do this, the data needs first to be collected, stored and processed in a structured manner. This is not an easy step as the data coming from so many different sources is very diverse in type, in quality and in frequency. So we truly speak here of big data since we fulfill the three V's. Volume, data being used is, is large compared to other uh, data sources. Uh, variety. Uh, it comes from different sources, different formats generated by people as well as uh, computers. It can be images, it can be uh, sensor uh, parameters, it can be machine logs, it can be basically anything. Uh, and velocity. So the data is coming quickly and uh, more and more in a continuous manner. It is also vital that we ensure that users can keep control and maintain sovereignty over their data uh, at all times and that their data is always protected. Uh, the required technologies for these tasks are wrapped up for us as Bosch in a dedicated uh, IoT ecosystem that I will briefly show to you. Uh, this is the Bosch IoT suite. It's uh, our core software platform for IoT solutions. It already connects more than 10 million devices like vehicles, sensors in urban or agricultural applications or gateways in buildings. Uh, it consists of several different software services that provide key middleware capabilities needed to build IoT applications from top to bottom. It means always starting from the business needs. It's a flexible platform based on open source and industry standards and pre-configured packages relieve developers of much of the integration, integration effort previously necessary. Its main purpose is to bring the relevant data from a product to the business application. And the different layers offer the required tools for connecting and managing the devices, creating the digital twin, managing the data, and it is also offering the possibilities to do edge computing. Uh, it is available on global public clouds like Microsoft Azure or the Amazon Web Services, as well as the Bosch uh, IoT cloud, where we usually use it. Let's go back now to the value creation cycle. In the AI phase, we process the data using data science and machine learning algorithms and can gain new findings on this basis. We can then close the loop by improving our products with this knowledge. Um, but here it's the difference. As Bosch, our core expertise lies in the physical products and technologies. And our big advantage is the domain knowledge that ranges from automotive to consumer goods, to industrial or building technologies, 
And this vast domain knowledge allows us to understand the incoming data onto a deeper level and identify possible new or missing data sources and even create new cross-selling business opportunities. If for uh, AI algorithms, maybe the domain knowledge is not so critical, for a data scientist it is. A data science is an interdisciplinary field with various skills uh, required. You need to know mathematics, statistics, machine learning, should be able to do software development, but you also need to gain specific domain knowledge in order to be able to understand uh, your data and interpret your results uh, and also have some traditional research skills because um, a data scientist is often described as a data detective. The standard process for data-driven product or service development that we also use here is the cross-industry standard process for data mining. A CRISP DM is not new. It was conceived in 96 and became a European Union project in 97. It's like a set of guardrails to help you plan, organize and implement your data science or even machine learning project. And it describes a data science life cycle. It starts with the business understanding. What does the business need? What is the problem you're trying to solve? The next step um, is the data understanding. What data do we have? What data do we need? Maybe we're missing something. How clean is it? How is it available? Um, and this goes back and forth between business understanding and data understanding. And here the domain knowledge is vital. Then we go forward to preparing uh, the data and we need to ask ourselves, how do we organize the data for modeling? Modeling, of course, question is, OK, what are the best techniques that we should apply? And then we need to uh, evaluate which of these models meets the business objective. And if we have managed in the end to answer to the business questions, we need to go to the deployment and make the results accessible for the stakeholders. Here's a practical example. Um, connected parking. I'm sure everyone gets uh, annoyed sometimes when trying to find a parking spot in the city center. But let's look at some numbers from Germany that show how annoying parking really is. We consume way too much fuel looking for a spot and produce unnecessary amounts of CO2 in the process. Then we pay the parking fees or the fines for not paying the parking fees, depend on what you prefer. It also appears that we do a lot of damage to our cars while trying to park. So why not let the car park itself? Apparently, 63% of the German drivers would have no issue with letting the car do all the maneuvers. And before you say that parking is only a problem for women, a statistics show that women park faster than men, even though they need some more steering movements. And unsurprisingly, having some experience with driving and parking actually helps. Well, the search for available uh, parking is becoming increasingly simple for drivers in big cities. Uh, with a community-based parking system developed by Bosch, a multitude of vehicles take part simultaneously in the search for isolated uh, parking spaces scattered throughout the city and in the end find them more quickly. Most modern vehicles are already equipped with uh, parking sensors like the ultrasonic sensor from Bosch that scans the surrounding of the car at all times and thus detects empty parking spaces. The connectivity hardware such as the connectivity control unit is mounted on the car right from the factory. With this equipment, the transmitter vehicle can reliably transmit the collected and encrypted data and send it to the cloud. There it is collected, aggregated and processed further into digital parking maps. Uh, this way, the receiver vehicle are given precise information on where empty parking spaces are. 
Um, the receiver vehicle itself requires only a smartphone or, or onboard navigation system uh, to display the available parking spaces. So the great advantage is that even vehicles without sensor equipment can also use the community-based parking service. The real challenge lies in providing a comprehensive and highly precise snapshot of the current parking situation. And here it's where the unique community aspect comes into play. The gather information is subsequently reprocessed uh, for parking seekers. And as a first step, the system generates a parking area map. Uh, the system is also constantly learning and also employs data mining uh, techniques, for example, to distinguish between um, parking spaces and driveways. Uh, based on the parking area map, uh, Bosch then offers a parking prediction plus a real-time occupancy map. And as a result, the more drivers who participate in this community-based parking, the more accurate and relevant the collectively generated parking information becomes for all users. And when no free spot is available on the streets, you can turn to a garage and let the car park itself. And this is the automated valid parking, um, AVP, uh, and it's the most, the world's first infrastructure supported solution that provides an automatic drive up and park service. It allows the vehicle to be left at the drop off area of the parking garage without further ado. And all the driver needs to do is activate the smartphone app. This application then establishes the digital contact with the parking garage and the route to a free parking spot is computed. This is when the Bosch technology in the parking garage takes charge. Uh, the pilot parking garage in Stuttgart has some 180 um, Bosch ceiling mounted stereo cameras with integrated algorithms uh, in order to detect objects and measure distances. They send their images and metadata to a server in a separate room in the building. Stored on the server is a digital map, a simplified blueprint of the building. And here it breaks the parking garage down into tiny grid squares, no larger than a few centimeters. The server aligns data from the cameras with uh, this individual grids, detects the position of people, objects, uh, and the car using parameters such as size, direction of movement, and identifies in this way the available parking spaces. The server uses a predefined path that is stored on the digital map to guide the car through the parking structure. A path actually consists of many individual segments, each of which contains specifications such as driving speed and curve radius. The server calculates a driving command for each segment and sends it out to guide the vehicle segment by segment uh, into the parking space. This uh, slow progress is, it's, it's not perceivable uh, by the car. Uh, Bosch is using cameras instead of LiDAR sensors, for example, in the parking garage, because um, it has many advantages. It's cheaper, it's not constricting the lane, and it's integrating much more easier into the infrastructure. Cameras can also be retrofitted to turn older buildings into high-tech parking garage. Uh, the cameras also monitor the driving corridor and its surroundings and can detect unexpected obstacles or persons in the car's path so that the vehicle can react immediately. They send this information to the server which relays it to the vehicle in that section in the blink of an eye. Um, the floor has a speckled pattern and this helps the camera detect objects. Um, so the car will slow down when an obstacle is several meters away 
and then it will step uh, stop when the gap closes to four meters. It breaks instantly if a person or a suitcase or other obstacles come any closer than four meters. Driving commands are calculated several times per second in parallel on the main server and on a second server uh, to make sure that we can react instantly. But the command is only actually sent to the car if both computers give the go ahead, so they have the same calculation. Failing that, the vehicle stops immediately. Um, this autonomous driving system is faster than the average driver. It doesn't experience that uh, moment of surprise or shock when the human brain has to process a hazard before uh, reacting. It also has multiple safeguards. Uh, there are various monitoring programs constantly checking all components for functions um, and are in turn supervised by safety software just in normal uh, automotive software development. Since parking is done fully autonomously, cars also don't need much clearance for people opening doors and getting out. Uh, so the parking lot capacity will probably increase by up to 20% um, as more of this automated valid parking gains traction. And of course, um, it will also automatize the uh, payment process, so you will not uh, be able to not pay the fee uh, because the um, license plate of the car will be scanned uh, when you enter and when you exit the garage and payment will be done through the app automatically. Bosch experts and authorities um, hope to get the approval of this parking system in the P6 parking garage in Stuttgart for mass production in uh, autumn of this year. Uh, and we are already talking to automotive manufacturers and parking garage operators in other countries also. And um, I hope we will succeed because I think it's universally true that nobody really likes parking. So as a conclusion, I think IoT offers great promise in the residential and mobility applications, what we call the live domain. But it has to fulfill some conditions. It has to be aware of its surrounding, autonomous in collecting, processing and transmitting data and actionable, meaning that AI derived conclusions are turned into actions. Still, uh, a singular solution offers minimal value for companies. A vibrant IoT ecosystem of connected solutions designed based on a user-centric approach unlocks valuable potential for companies and consumers alike. And this is actually our day-to-day -day business in the Engineering Center in Cluj, where we work on all levels involved in such applications, from the development of smart sensors electronic control or communication units, data pipelines, cloud platforms, data science and AI solutions for various use cases from the mobility sector, but not only. And um, with this, I would conclude my presentation. Uh, cool, thanks a lot for the overview. Um, and we do have a couple of uh, questions. Um, one is what AI models are you using and what are the problems that are solved? Like uh, referring to XGBoost. Yeah, so there are actually a lot of different models uh, used and problems that we are uh, solving. Um, for example, in this um, garage topic, uh, we need to collect the feed of roughly 30 cameras um, at the same time to be able to monitor enough space where the camera, the, the car will be driving. Um, so there are different challenges there. On one hand, you need to be able to collect all this data. 
uh, put it together and then you need to have trained uh, algorithms that will de detect cars, people, uh, lost objects like suitcases, uh, clothes or even maybe some parts that can be broken from, from a car. Uh, so this goes a lot into the direction of um, computer vision, image processing, um, but then you need to turn all the commands that are, um, let's say, decided by the image processing part into a command that goes to the car. And here you will encounter again um, AI when you discuss about safety topics, because you always have a redundant system, not just on the uh, computer vision part, but also in the card. You have uh, safety uh, systems that will always double check anything that the car does, especially when we talk about autonomous cars, because you do not want to risk um, that someone is hacking your car and sending uh, wrong uh, directions to it. So there is also something called intrusion detection, which is also based on algorithms. So it's it's the problem itself is quite uh, complex and it has to solve various uh, small tasks which in the end will give a big solution. Right, so I know this is a, I know, sort of a generic question, but in your opinion, um, how soon will uh, I know, autonomous driving uh, become, let's say, a commodity or we see it, uh, let's say, in our streets? Well, it will be a while because for autonomous driving, it's not just the car that needs to has, have the capabilities, but you will also need to connect the infrastructure. So the car can recognize, for example, um, signs or uh, the colors on, on the lights, traffic and so on. But to be able to be fully autonomous, you will need to be connected uh, to other cars connected to the traffic lights so that when you go into inter intersection, you're not limited only by your field of view, but get the information also from the side paths. And until that will happen, I think this will depend a lot on each country's government. Right. Yeah, I think it's, uh, and also there's all this sort of uh, issues I was uh, reading at some point that uh, I don't know if you have a, an accident in the car, whose fault is this? Who's liable for it? Is it the driver? Is it the autonomous system? Another big issue is connectivity. Uh, and not uh, that you're driving through the mountains and you lose contact to the network, but another legal problem is what happens when you drive from one country to the other and you need to log into a different um, Network, um, do you have a pause in between in which your car doesn't know what to do? How will this hand check uh, happen? Uh, and besides this, if we go back to the topic of AI, it is quite easy to train on usual uh, situation, on usual signs, on, on usual markings, on pedestrians. But what happens when you need to detect some weird objects or a car, uh, a cow? Uh, sheep or other a bear. I mean, the more you go from Germany where you will never or almost never encounter a bear or a wolf on the street and you go maybe, I don't know, to the to Norway where you need to be careful about reindeer or you come to us, you need to be careful about dogs, cats and everything else. You need to train those situation also. All right, so it's it's something that's really hard to predict. I mean, uh, sometimes uh, you see uh, people that are doing this, I call them sort of uh, fake forecasting, like uh, yeah, in the future, uh, autonomous driving will be around. Yeah, we all know that uh, it's going to be the future, but when it will happen, there's a lot of building blocks for it. You to... can have it in specific situations, like a parking garage, which is a more uh, constrained and limited space but to have it on completely free, whatever sort of road, uh, that is going to take a while. What we will have definitely is autonomous driving, but on a lower level where you also have interaction from the driver. 
so not completely fully uh, yeah, good that you mentioned this uh, sorry to interrupt because there's also a question uh, in the chat so uh, the you mentioned the valet parking is that working just based on uh, vehicle sensors or a smart parking garage is also needed so the valid parking is working uh, on the garage sensor the community-based parking is working based on the car sensor the automated valid parking works uh, on the information gathered by the cameras in the garage. All right, so then you need uh, both. Yeah, depending on the solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I also had a, a question. I was wondering, uh, I recently what read about... <laughs> I always am paying. Um, I was reading about Tesla ditching um, the, the LiDAR systems uh, in order to, to enable fully automated driving and just relying on uh, on cameras, you know, just, just to do object detection. Uh, because uh, from what I remember, the reasoning was uh, that if the two systems, the, the cameras and the LiDAR, don't agree on something, which one do you pick? I, I was wondering, what are your thoughts on this uh, on this subject? Um, so far, what we are trying to do is combine all the sensors from the car. Uh, the ultrasonic uh, sensors that you use for parking, the cameras, LiDAR, so the more information you get, the better. Uh, in the end, which one will have the upper hand? Um, I cannot tell you for the moment. Uh, but um, for most of our solutions, we are trying to get as much data as possible. I don't think mm. having too much data can be an issue. <laughs> I, yeah, um, I am going to avoid having uh, making a bad joke at the expense of Tesla. <laughs> so, so, but but I totally agree. Yeah, you, you generally want to, to gather as much data as you can, unless you're trying to sell cars uh, like Tesla is doing. So, uh, <laughs> bad joke. But told you, I'm not a yeah. fan of Tesla. Yeah, but if you need to take a decision, try to take the decision based on data and not by excluding data. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. You're, you're <laughs> totally right. Um, I also, also a question I had uh, from the from the Q and A. Uh, could you give us some details about the the AI models uh, you're using and uh, how you're using them? Maybe just I don't know the the. Well, I, I think actually was... asked them in the in the other order, so then we did tackle that one. Ah, you got me on this. So, I cannot give you too many details, but I can tell you it goes from, uh, let's say, simple computer vision algorithms to deep learning to all sorts of neural networks depending on the problem you're trying to solve. As I said, some problems are respect to detecting an object in an image. Others can be detecting a potential intrusion to your car. And then there are a completely different set of methods that you need to use. Um, how we use them? Well, some parts are already embedded. Uh, on the cameras, on the electronic controls unit in the car, and uh, others are separated, like for the garage topic, where you need to collect the data from all the cameras that are mounted in the garage, all the computation is taken by a server. You don't do this computation in the car. So again, it, it varies from use case to use case. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Cool. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Augusta. Uh, it's been again nice presentation. It gave uh, this gave me more insight in uh, how you're approaching things and where this is heading. Uh, and uh, it's been awesome having you here at NDR.